evening everyone and uh, welcome to our time of worship together here uh, gathered as God's family even though remotely and so on and so forth uh, gathered together to worship God uh, in his presence uh, and if you've already uh, tuned in to our morning service today you'll know that we have been thinking about that presence of God thinking about how uh, that presence of God even though we be apart is with us and has bound us together as a people and as a family and it's into that presence that we enter again now in worship together so let's join our hearts together in prayer let's pray gracious god we give you thanks for every opportunity that we have to worship together and we pray now lord god that as we share from your word as we sing praise together here this evening as we pray together tonight lord that we feel you with us lord that we know your presence with us and God, indeed, that this be a time that is a blessing for us all. So be with us in your name. Amen. Tonight we're going to uh, continue to look at the, the book of Habakkuk. Uh, know over this last uh, few weeks, you maybe think, wow, is there anything else they can get out of this three chapters, out of this small book? But there's plenty going on. And this evening I'm going to share with you uh, something else from chapter three of Habakkuk. Uh, but we're also going to have some time of praise together and we're going to do that right now. I'm going to throw to Reese, and uh, Reese is going to lead us in praise as we sing together of that amazing grace that we have found. Uh, grace that has lifted us out of the pit, that has saved wretches like you and me. And we're going to sing uh, about that grace now. join our hearts together in prayer let's pray gracious God we give you thanks that this time Lord is set aside for you and Lord whenever we're we're watching this whether we're watching this Lord God bang on seven o'clock with everyone else whether Lord God we've we've had to do other bits and pieces and we're sitting down finally to watch this later in the evening whether even indeed Lord God this is weeks and months and years potentially after Lord this has been recorded we know that we are in your presence and we know Lord God that in your presence is the best place for us to be God, lift our hearts this evening to praise your name. Lift our hearts this evening in true worship of you. We thank you, Lord God, that we can do this. Lord, that we enjoy this freedom, that there is this opportunity to, to open your word together and to learn more about you. And Lord, we delight in the fact that there's always more to know. There's always more to learn. There's never, Lord God, a limit to what we can find out and what we can discover about you because you are so vast, you're so amazing. You are beyond the universe, Lord, and we thank you for that. We pray, Lord, then here this evening that as we worship, as we read from your word, and as we think about you, God, indeed, that this be a time when we are lifted up, 
Lord God, where our hearts are uplifted. And Father, we sing psalms of praise to you in the same manner as Habakkuk. Lord, we, we acknowledge and we recognise that when we stand before you, when we lay our, our, ourselves bare before you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit shines a light on our sinfulness, shines a light, Lord God, on just the depth of sin that's in our hearts. And Lord, time and time again, we try, and when we try to be, to do the right thing, we try, Lord God, to, to say the right things, and we fail so miserably time and time and time again. God, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, that we, that we do mess up. We forgive us, Lord God, that we do let you down. Forgive us, Lord God, that, that time and time again that sin grows in our hearts. Lord, lift that sin away from us as we confess to you. Lift us out of that sinfulness. Give us new hearts. Give us new songs, Lord God, of praise to you. Give us, Lord God, that forgiveness that only comes from you. Oh, we so richly and so strongly desire that, Lord, over and above all things. So, God, give that to us this day. And Holy Spirit, then, comfort us in the knowledge that you are with us. With us, even in those darkest of times, even in those times when our hearts are most turned away from you, you're still walking there with us. You're still dwelling in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, help us then to understand your word even more. For we want to understand your word even more. We want to understand the Father all the more. We want to understand the Son all the more. We want to understand you, Holy Spirit, all the more. Help us then. Open our hearts and our minds. May we not be closed-minded as we so often are to you this day. Instead, open our minds and open our hearts so that we can see you clearly, that we can love you more dearly, and we can follow you more nearly. Oh Lord God, we ask these things in your name. Amen. What an awesome privilege it is to pray to God. What an awesome privilege it is to be able to, to come into his presence in such a manner and, and lay ourselves bare before him. It's such a privilege, isn't it? And what a privilege we have to be able to read the word of God together. And we're going to continue to do that here tonight. Uh, we've been looking at Habakkuk over these last few weeks. This little uh, book of prophecy uh, tucked in there in amongst the minor prophets and, and indeed a book that, that some of you have, have got in contact with us and, and told us that you never actually engaged with before in scripture uh, and that's exciting whenever we, we, we discover something new in the Bible even though the Bible has been with us all our lives uh, but we can learn something new about God and we can learn something about how we can engage with God and worship him all the better and all the more. Uh, so we're going to continue reading from Habakkuk chapter 3 here this evening and uh, we're going to read from verse 4 down to verse 15 so this is the word of God his splendor was like the sunrise rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden plague went before him pestilence followed his steps he stood and shook the earth he looked and made the nations tremble the ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. But he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Cushion in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea? When you rode your horses and your chariots to victory, you uncovered your bow, and you called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. Amen. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord, as we share from your word here this evening, we pray that you lead us and you guide us and that you help us, Lord, to understand more of you 
God, as we engage then with this passage and as we engage with this, this part of, of Habakkuk, Lord, may indeed it be a blessing to us, Lord God, and in turn, may we be a blessing to you. For we ask this in your name. Amen. I, I love a good documentary series. I like to be able to, to watch something that is well-researched, uh, something that I feel I've, I've kind of learnt something by the end of. Uh, and it's one of the attractions for me of, of a streaming service like Netflix. You see, Netflix have these long box sets of, of documentaries on there. Uh, they have everything from true crime documentaries to sports to film to historical programmes. And they even have one about toys. Netflix has a, a documentary called The Toys That Made Us. Uh, and basically the premise of this show is that they, they take around about 45 to 50 minutes for each of these different toy lines. And they talk about their development. They talk about how, the impact that they had upon culture and society, not just in maybe one country, but right around the world. And they talk then about how that made an impact on people as people grew up. Uh, and one of the, the, the toys that they talked about is one that's very dear to my heart, Star Wars toys. And there's this documentary in the toys that made us talks about the development of Star Wars toys. It's really interesting to see just how that concept of bringing toys to life from the movie came, came into being. But one thing that really struck me about it is this. In the beginning of this toy line, there was great, great trepidation. There were many toy companies who simply said, we don't think it's going to work. Many toy companies who were very, very well known at the time and great toy producers refused to make Star Wars toys because they believed that they would never sell. They believed that they would never make any money from Star Wars toys. And it took a, a small company to take a chance and to produce not a toy, but the promise of a toy. For Christmas in 1977, there were no Star Wars toys, but children had been devouring the movie for six months. They wanted something. So for Christmas, for $30 or something like that, you could buy a card that said when the Star Wars toys were produced, you would receive some. And it sold like mad. A piece of paper, a card, that's all it was. But what it did was it proved the concept that there was indeed a demand for toys from Star Wars. And as the toys went into production, well, we know what happened next. It's a multi, multi billion dollar industry now, Star Wars. You know that, that everyone has got a Star Wars toy or has had a Star Wars toy in their house at some point, probably. And that, that many of us, certainly my generation, grew up desiring Star Wars toys. Why? Because we knew that they would be good. We knew that they were a proven commodity. We knew that if we had a Star Wars toy, we would be able to recreate the films in our, on our beds or whatever it was, be able to, to, to play with those toys that were proven, that had a track record. You know, when we think about something that we want to put our trust in, something that we want to, to really, uh, really to rely on, it tends to be those things that have a track record. It tends to be those things that to us have been proven time and time again. For example, I'm recording this sermon this evening on an iPhone. Now I've had iPhones for the last 10 years. Why do I always buy iPhones? Well, maybe it's a case of being sucked in, I don't know. But what I find is that I've never had a problem with my iPhones. I've never had an iPhone that has broken by itself. I've never had an iPhone in the last 10 years with all the various iterations that I've owned that has let me down. It's been proven to work for me. It does what I needed to do. And therefore, I will continue to put my trust in it. I'll be, continue to record my sermons on it. I'll continue to record these services. I'll continue to use these phones as long as I understand, as long as they don't let me down. As we've gone through the book of Habakkuk, We've seen something uh, going on here with Habakkuk. Something has been going on with Habakkuk from, from the beginning to now. 
a change in his, his mindset, a change in how he's looking at life and how he's looking at the world around him. You know, in the, at the right very, very beginning of, of the book, we saw him lamenting and we saw him crying out to God as he's crying out and saying, what is going on in the world around me, God? Look at all these things. Nations are rising up against us. People are turning away from you. This isn't good. This is bad. We see him really looking at God and almost being accusing of God, really lamenting and crying out with a strong plea to God to see what is going on. And God answers Habakkuk in Habakkuk 1 verse 5 with what is still my favourite verse in the whole of the book, where he says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. You see, even in the midst of Habakkuk's doubt and his worry, God is saying, I'm going to do something amazing. Something that will utterly amaze you. And after being convinced by this, uh, by God, and, and being convinced by what God is going to do, we, we find here in chapter 3, Habakkuk in the throes of, of a psalm, of a psalm of praise to God. Now, David introduced to us last week the first stanza, if you like, of this psalm. And today we're going to look at what would be the sort of the second part of this psalm, where, where Habakkuk goes into a, 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 a sort of a place where he is recalling the things that God has done. Recalling and bringing to mind the incredible things that God has won and has done over the years for his people. We see him thinking about, about that great story of the Exodus. How, how God brought his people out of Egypt. How he brought them out of, of that land and how he brought them into the promised land. And what stands out about Habakkuk's words are the contrast that exists between the way the Babylonians, the very, very human and evil army and nation, uh, come and, and do their will and what God actually does. The Babylonians, you know, conquest is one of terror and bloodshed, whereas God is one of awe, one of amazement, one of absolute brilliance, one of power, one of majesty, one of authority. You know, the nations that, that, were, that were dispossessed by the Babylonians rose up against them and will rise up against them. And God has told Habakkuk in the previous chapters that this is going to happen. But Habakkuk calls to mind here then the power of God. He calls to mind what God has done. And how he, he talks about this is evident then in the verses. And what he remembers about God and what God has done is evident in the verses. He says in Habakkuk 3 verse 4, His splendour was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Now, you might look at that and say, well, what, what's he talking about there, Aaron? Well, think about light. Think about how Habakkuk might have thought about the light. Think about the, the, the story of the Exodus, how there was that pillar of light to lead the people, how there was the fire on the mountain, how Moses shone with light from his face whenever he encountered God. These are the things that Habakkuk is bringing to mind. He's remembering the light is powerful. The light is pure power and it represents the pure power of God. Light will always defeat darkness. We know this. When it comes to the New Testament and it comes to the coming of Christ, we think about John chapter 1 and the wonderful, wonderful chapter that we have there. And what, what, the, what John says about Jesus coming. He says in John 1 verse 5, The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. How relevant then to the people of Israel. How relevant will that be as they call that to mind themselves, even in the throes of this, of this exile and this occupation by the Babylonians? The other morning I couldn't sleep. I was waking periodically uh, up through the night. Eventually I started to see the sunrise. And what was once a dark sky had no answers to the onslaught of life that Luke's experiencing. Though it was cloudy, even they were being lit by the sunrise. Light cannot be defeated. It will always defeat the dark. For you today, you may be listening to this, and you yourself, you might be experiencing a state of darkness. And it's not darkness for you. It could be different to what the darkness is for me. 
but it's as real for you as what it ever would be for me. There may be things going on in your life that you're really struggling with and are leading you to a dark place. The darkness can really, really drag us down. If I was to begin to listen to all of the things that are going on with you, it might drag me down. If you were to be able to listen to all the things that are going on with me, I might drag you down to a dark, dark place. But as deep as the darkness gets, as deep as the darkness can be, the light shines and it breaks the gloom. Folks, I say if I say nothing more of note that you remember in this sermon, when you remember that, can you remember that God is light? Can you remember that as dark as it gets, as dark as, as things might feel, as dark as, 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 as your current situation or predicament may be, as dark as the thoughts are in your mind, God is light. And light always defeats the darkness. Light always defeats the darkness. Habakkuk calls to mind the rays of light that shook from the hands of God. He calls that to mind and it brings him hope. Why? Because light always defeats the darkness. He goes on. He says from verse 5 to 7, Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled, the age-old hills collapsed, but he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Cushion in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. And in these first verses, you know, Habakkuk deals with how God has moved in the land. Plague and pestilence refers to the terrible visitation of the angel that moved on the firstborn sons of the people of Egypt. The mountains trembling, referring again to God's power over his people that were witnessed at Mount Sinai. The tents of Cushion and Midian, referring to the news that these people had been freed uh, from the Pharaoh's hand through the work of God and how that had gone to other nations and they heard about it. And they feared and they stood before the Lord trembling because they knew there was power are here. Habakkuk recalls this and it reminds him of who God is. Reminds him of what God has done. Reminds him that God is powerful. That God is bigger than any situation that he faces at this time. That God has proven time and time again that when he moves in power there is no one that can stand up to it. Habakkuk remembers this and it brings him great hope and it brings him great comfort. What about you? Where well, how have you seen God move in your life before? How have you seen God operate within your life before? Has there been times when God has answered a prayer? Where it's come and it's been, been maybe come immediately or maybe it came after a period of time. But God has absolutely directly shown his power in your life. How did that make you feel? Was it great? Did you kind of just let it wash over you? Do you even remember it? Folks, God moves powerfully in our hearts and in our minds all the time. He moves in an amazing way in our lives every day. Do you remember those times? Do you call them to mind? Do you remember what God has done for you? Or do you just take it for granted? Forget about it. Move on to the next thing. Disregard almost in some ways what God has done. Don't fall into that trap. Don't fall into that way of thinking. God has proven himself to you. God has shown that he is the best, that he is the most powerful, that he has done things that others have heard about and, and have shook and trembled. God has done this. So remember that. As Habakkuk is recalling all of these things, he's reminding himself that this is the track record of God. This is what God has done. And therefore, he believes, and I believe, that God can do it again. 8 to 10, he says, Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow. 
You call for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and they writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. <laughs> what on earth is he talking about here? Well, again, he's going back to this story. The story of the Exodus. The rivers turned to blood in Exodus chapter 7. There's an indication of what the Lord can do. The Red Sea is parted for the people to walk through. But those who were wicked succumbed to the sea and it ate up their chariots and their horses. You know, water is, is one of those elements that we, we cannot live without. Yet it's also one that we believe that we've tamed. But however as hard we try, we cannot tame the waters. We cannot completely contain them. People may say, well, we've got drains and we have dams and we use water for this thing and that thing and there are other things. But control over the waters is so fleeting. And it's subject to us having to work hard all the time to ensure that it works. But we can never truly control it. You know, we see that whenever the hard rains come, don't we? The floodwaters rise. You see that whenever the sea is so rough that we cannot safely travel on it. Even we see it in our houses. Think about that small little drip, drip, drip of water that continues to, to come out of the leaky pipe. And that small little drip of water we might not even realise is there. Might not even realise that it's causing damage to our houses. And it's only when something falls apart that we realise that this little ingress of water which we couldn't even see which we could not control has actually caused a, a, a lot of damage and probably cost us a pile of money in the process to get it fixed god controls the waters to habakkuk this is a great 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 encouragement a great reminder again of the power of god even that very water has nothing that it can do against the word of God. God controls and is over the waters. You know, I, I think again of the work of Christ. I think again of the work of Christ in our lives. I think again of the work of Christ with his disciples. He gives us so many amazing examples of him and how he lived. Whenever the disciples are in the boat in the Sea of Galilee and they are in fear of their lives, Whenever the waters are crashing against the boat and Jesus lies asleep. Whenever they go to him and they, they, they wake him up in a state of panic and fear and ask him, do you not even care if we die? And he gets up and he stills the water with a word. That's what our God can do. That's what our God is all about. That's what our God can do. He has power and authority over those very things that we have no control over. Those things that we may feel that we can control. And let's face it, folks, there's so many things in our lives that we think we're in control of. We think we have absolute control over everything, don't we? We like that idea that we are in control of our destiny, all of those things. But the reality is we control so little and we cannot hold on to things that we do not control. We don't like this idea that we're not in control. We don't like this idea that we have to concede, if you like, that we're not in control. But the one who is, is gracious. The one who is in control is loving. The one who is in control loves his people. The one who is in control does indeed care if we die. He gets up, he wakes up and stands in the boat and says, quiet, be still. And shows his absolute authority even over those horrible things that go on within our lives. Folks, there's a drip, drip, drip constantly in our lives in many, many areas. It can be situations. It can be relationships. It can be a good relationship that's gone bad. It can be things that have happened to us that we cannot uh, get rid of, that we cannot forget. It could be illness. And that drip, drip, drip goes on in our lives. And eventually causes a wound. Eventually causes something which is, uh, needs repaired. Our God is the one who can repair. Our God is the one who has control even over the drip, drip, drip of things in our lives. As Habakkuk goes on, we finish off uh, this, this 
chapter, part of chapter 3, which you've been reading here. And he says this in, in 3.13. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from hand, head to foot. You know, this goes back again to, to memories of the past for Habakkuk. The anointed one could refer to the people of God, the leader of the land of wickedness, to the Pharaoh and those who led that nation. But it also could apply to all of those who have risen up to oppress the people of God. Those who, who come and it will bring them comfort to remember that God wins time and time and time again. For the people of exile, this will serve as an encouragement to those after exile. They'll have to deal with occupation again by Alexander the Great. And then, of course, the, the, the occupation of the Romans, which will come and Christ will come into that too. They will remember that God overcomes the wicked. And in many ways, this serves a function of encouraging them regarding earthly oppressors. The truth is, the greatest oppressor that we have in our lives is sinfulness. The ruler of the kingdom of the air. The oppressor is the master of sinfulness and lies. The evil one whispers doubt and deception and seeks to destroy all in his wake. It's because of that that Christ comes. Because of that, Jesus is our salvation. When the angel spoke to Mary in Matthew 1, 21, says she will give birth to a son, or spoke to Joseph, sorry, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from his sins. Joseph is told by the angel that Jesus will do as his name suggests. He will save and he will rescue. He will save the people from the most terrible enemy that they face. That is their sin. The salvation that they will experience is a spiritual one. A salvation from their sins. From the power and dominion, pollution and guilt, the damning power of them all. And at last from the very being of them all from Satan. And the law from death, hell, wrath to come. It is perfect, it's complete, and it endures forever. Praise the Lord. This is the salvation that Jesus brings. This is the great victory that Jesus brings, leading us away from the, the leader of wickedness. This is the salvation that we can be sure of, that is true, that he will do completely what he says he will do because he has proven time and time again that he does what he says he will do. You know, I, I think in our lives, we are very quick to forget the track record of God. So we forget the track record of God and, and, and we turn to questioning him as to whether or not he can really do the things that we, we want him to do or the things that he says he will do. But here's the truth in the scriptures. God comes through. Time and time and time again, he comes through. God should not have to prove himself to you. And yet we so often want him to. What we know is he has proven himself and he continues to do so. So I want to ask a question of you now. And ask you to think about this. And maybe for some of you this could form something of an exercise. You see, what, what Habakkuk is doing here is he's writing a psalm of praise to God. It's a response to, to what God has done for him. It's a response to the things that he knows God has done and the comfort that he takes from that. He's applying it, albeit in a in very poetic way, to what he sees going on around him, what he has been told by God is to come. And, and responding to all of those things by writing this psalm of praise, by remembering what God has done in the past. So what about you? What's God done for you? Honestly, I want you to think about this. What has God done for you? You know, if you're, if you're sitting and you're, you're really struggling to come up with anything at all, <laughs> Then, then remember, in the very, very least, that God has rescued you from your sinfulness, that he has opened the way to eternity for you. I mean, that is reason to sing songs of victory and praise, is it not? But think about your life. Think about the things that you've experienced in your life. Think about the things that have gone on. Think about the people that God has brought into your life. Are you thankful for them? 
Are you thankful for those who, who have been a blessing to you down the years? Even those who maybe have passed on? Are you, do you give thanks to God that you had that time? That you had that experience with those people? Do you give thanks to God that you, you have a church? Do you give thanks to God that there are people who have helped you grow in your faith? Do you remember those things? Are you thankful at all? Have you, have you thought about the way that God has blessed you in your life time and time again? Do you think about that? God has proven himself to you. Not that he should have to, but he has. He's done it to me. He's proven his goodness to me time and time and time again. When, I'll tell you a very, very, very short story and that's it. When we were, we were young, sorry, Michael was young. And he was a, a, a lovely, bouncy wee baby, but he always got sick. He always had little, little illnesses, you know. If, we got a cold, if he got a cold, uh, then he would invariably get a chest infection or something like that. And at seven months old, Michael got profoundly ill. And he lay in a hospital ward in intensive care for two weeks in a coma. Uh, we nearly lost him. It was terrible. It was a horrendous thing. But God brought him through. I have no doubt that God brought him through. We were told uh, at certain times that Michael would have a, a life-limiting, or life-threatening and limiting illness. Uh, he would have to get tests done every now and again periodically to see how he was getting on. And I remember really well a phone call from a consultant in the Royal Hospital. He phoned me up whenever Michael was around about four years old. And he told me that Michael had no trace of this immune deficiency. He told me that whatever had happened, Michael was healed. He asked me did I believe in something more. I told him I did. Uh, at the time, we had our uh, people praying for Micah in, in First Hollywood Presbyterian Church in such a wonderful and powerful way. Folks, I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten what God has done for me and my family. I've never forgotten that in the midst of the most terrible worry, God showed up and proved himself. Proved himself to be more powerful than the drip, drip, drip of doubt that was in my heart and in my mind. Showed himself to be more powerful than the, than the, the, the troubles and the struggles that I had in my life. Proved himself to be more powerful than the darkness that often came into my heart and into my mind when it came to thinking about how worried I was about my wee boy. Folks, not everyone has a, a dramatic thing to share like that. But I can guarantee this. God has shown up in your life and he's proven himself. It's time for you then to think about that and write your psalm of praise to God. Your psalm of praise that rem rem remembers and rejoices in what he has done for you. That's what Habakkuk's doing here. He's remembering and rejoicing in what God has done for the people of Israel. What's God done for you? How are you going to sing praise to his name because of those things? And how are you going to share that then with people who are desperate to hear some good news? Desperate to hear some words of life at the moment? Folks, God has proven himself time and time again. Then put your trust in him. Not in yourself, but in him. Let's join together in prayer. Lord God, I give you thanks that you do indeed show up time and time again in our lives and you prove yourself to us God you've proven yourself to be good you've proven yourself to be strong and powerful you've proven yourself Lord God to be above all things Lord we're sorry that we forget that we're sorry Lord God when we look to ourselves we're sorry Lord God when we we put trust in in things that are not of you help us then to to be a people who remember and to remember well Lord God, a people then who, who reflect you and show you to the world who so desperately need to hear you. Help us to be a people, Lord God, who are, who are open to the fact that you are amazing. Open to the fact that you can do all things 
and help us then to be that people who sing a psalm of praise to you. So God, be with us all. Bless us all. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So Reese is going to uh, lead us again in praise. Uh, and after he does, I come back and, and uh, say a little benediction for us and, and just wish you uh, all the best. Thank you for, for joining me here this evening. Uh, I pray that this has been helpful, that it's been encouraging, uh, that these times of, of worship and praise together, um, even though remotely and, and even though we're not able to, to, to be in the same room as one another, have been helpful for you. and They're helping you grow in some way during this lockdown period. I know that actually being able to, to sit in the Word and to spend a, a little bit more time in the Word than even I would do in, on a normal week uh, in preparation, but also in personal study, has been a real blessing at this time. So... Uh, I trust and I pray that that's the same for you as well. Remember that we are indeed trying to 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 fill the internet with as much as we possibly can. Um, we are uh, we're learning as we go along. Uh, believe it or not, we're not trained in this, <laughs> making these videos and so on and so forth. So there have been a lot of trial and error over this last wee while, and a lot of us trying to try and bits and pieces, getting bits wrong, having to go back do it all again. We're 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 just. You know, have, having to do a, a bit of a, a bit of everything at the moment and learn some new skills, and in some ways that's been quite tiring and quite exhausting. But we're we're glad to be able to do it, and hopefully it's something that uh, post lockdown, whatever church looks like, uh, we we'll be able to still employ in some ways and still be able to use in in some ways. But uh, before I, I say a benediction, uh, let me let me assure you of of my prayers for each of you. Uh, assure you of the prayers of our family we're missing you terribly uh, we're missing um, being able to fellowship with you um, but we are praying for you uh, praying for you all and um, thank you for your messages of encouragement please keep them coming that's me being selfish here but they really do help and uh, uh, let us let it be known indeed that we we love you with a love that is pure a love that is from our lord and it's as uh, joining us as brothers and sisters in christ together let's join our hearts together in prayer Lord, we thank you that you are everything to us. 
We thank you, Lord God, that you are above all things. And we pray, Lord God, now that as we, as we end our, our time of worship together, Lord God, that, that we don't forget what we've been thinking about, that we don't forget what you've t- shared with us here this evening. But instead, Lord God, we remember you, remember your track record, and we remember, Lord God, that you love us so much. So now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of us this day and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen.